you rushing off at the end of the Q and A? Good morning. Good morning. Please do come in, have a seat. We trust that you are well rested. I just have a couple of announcements for you. Uh, one, it has been our, our privilege to serve you during these uh, couple of days here. And we always want to grow and do better. And so if there are ways that we can do that, there is a conference evaluation. If you go to basicsconference.org forward slash evaluation, uh, you can fill that out and help us. And that will give you a discount code for next year as well. Uh, speaking of next year, uh, we have the privilege, and you will see this in your bags that you received, of having Colin Smith, who's from the Orchard Church just outside of uh, Chicago, in the Chicagoland area, and then William Phillip, who is the minister at the Tron Church. So if you struggle with Scottish accents, next year is not your year. <clears throat> uh, but we are, we are delighted. They have been incredibly gracious to us uh, as, as we've had to move dates a couple of times. And so May 8th through 10th, 2023, we look forward to that. And lastly, the recordings from these sessions, as long as, as, as will be available to you, you can download them free, use them however you like, and those will be available on, on the website as well. Uh, with all of that, I'll pray, and we will worship together. Lord God in heaven, we have come to meet with you this morning, and we know that we are unable to do that apart from the fact that our sins have been dealt with. And so we rejoice again in the Lord Jesus and we come humbly and boldly to your throne of grace to help us in our time of need, asking that you would help us, that we would worship in spirit and in truth. Help us, we ask. Amen. Let's stand and sing together this morning. 
Please turn to 2 Kings and chapter 7. And as you're finding that place, can I just say what a, what a real joy it has been to be with you over these days. Um, there are one or two negatives. One of the negatives is uh, that there are about 1,400 of you that I haven't met yet. Uh, but, uh, and, uh, and, and a whole lot more that I've only had brief conversations with. So not a whole lot more. Uh, others whom I've only had brief conversations with, but uh, dear brothers, it's been a great joy to be with you and uh, your warm welcome and the warmth of the fellowship, even in brief conversations, has been uh, a great blessing to me and thank you very much indeed. Now let's pray together. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. We pray, our God and Heavenly Father, that this morning, through the encouragement of the Scriptures, you would fill us with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may abound in hope. In the name of Jesus, our Saviour, we pray. Amen. What is, what is the right response to terrible suffering? That's a question that just must not be treated in a trite manner. There are many today, of course, um, who see suffering either in their personal experience or in the unspeakable horrors about which we hear almost daily as reason to turn away from God. I cannot accept a God who would allow that to happen. Indeed, I think it's true. Uh, I have no evidence for this, but it just seems to be self-evidently true to me that the massive turning away from God that we have seen in the Western world since the mid-20th century and the consequences of which are being worked out in the destructive confusions of our time is, well, behind that is the experience of those two terrible world wars earlier in that century. It was as though collectively Westerners came to the view we cannot accept a God who would allow that to happen. By the middle of the 21st century, 
the events of our days will now no doubt pour fuel on that fire. How can we accept a God who allows these things to happen? As I say, friends, we must, we, we, we must, we cannot approach a question like this glibly with a formula, with a, with a learned answer, with a rote answer, with words, with a, with a statement only. I hope it's true that most of us feel at least some sympathy for that way of thinking. We can understand why a sufferer might want to have nothing to do with the God who did not prevent their suffering. How much more if they come to think that God is somehow directly responsible for what has happened? And I hope it's the case that we struggle to find anything appropriate to say. It makes no sense to suggest that God was not involved in any particular horror. God is God. There is nothing that happens that is outside his sovereign rule and control, and that includes the worst atrocities. And we cannot pretend that terrible suffering is less terrible and dreadful than it is. How could the experience of horrendous suffering not drive a person away from God. And yet, the Bible's message and the experience of millions of believers down the centuries is that the right response to suffering, even the most dreadful, the real way to find hope in the face of horror, light in the darkness, Peace in the turbulence is to turn to God. Now that's the Christian message, is it not? We have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul prayed that you may abound in hope. Peter, Always be prepared to give a defence to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you. And the context of such New Testament affirmations makes perfectly clear that this hope is typically experienced in suffering. But how is it possible? Really, how is it possible? What does it mean to turn to God in the midst of suffering. How does hope work? And that's the heading I've taken for what we are looking at this morning. Because we find that in the book of 2 Kings, uh, from chapter 6, verse 24, through to the end of chapter 7, this problem is presented in a particularly devastating experience of the people of Israel, more, more specifically, the citizens of Israel's chief city, Samaria. It's a long story, uh, too long for this preacher to manage in a single exposition. The rate he goes, I wonder whether he can get through any stories in a single exposition, you might say. <laughs> but in part one of this story, which was the chapter six bit from chapter six, 24 to 33, and we won't be dwelling on that this morning, but Israel's king came to the conclusion that in the dreadful circumstances in which he found himself, and they were unspeakably dreadful, he could no longer hope in God. See the, the very last words of chapter 6? Why should I wait? And this is the Old Testament vocabulary of hope that is used here. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Very briefly, this is what had happened. The city of Samaria had suffered the twin disasters of famine and a full-on siege of the city by none other than the king of Syria. Remember the king of Syria? The population of the city was slowly starving to death. 
We hear in the course of the story of two mothers who had resorted to cannibalism of their children. It was an unimaginable horror. The king of Israel himself was beside himself with despair. Understandably, he was powerless to help, and he knew it. Chapter 6, verse 27. He reasoned that God must be responsible for this horror since God had done nothing to relieve it in 6, verse 27 again. His response was to lash out at the man of God, Elisha, 6, verse 31, and to give up on hope in God. Again, see uh, verse 33 of chapter 6. This trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Well, we're going to follow what happened next. Because into this most hopeless of situations came the possibility of hope. How? Well, one, the source of hope, verses 1 and 2. Let me try and set the scene. We are at Elisha's house somewhere in the city. Uh, The elders of the city are inside with Elisha, which itself is an interesting fact, but we won't go into that. But the elders, the old guys, are almost comically leaning all their weight against the front door to keep it closed against those on the outside. And on the other side of the door, there is a messenger from the king. He's actually an assassin. He's been sent to take off Elisha's head and hence the old men straining against the door from the inside. The king himself has also now arrived outside the house with one or two others. So that's the scene. And now, from the inside of the house, the calm, firm voice of Elisha was heard. Chapter 7, verse 1. But Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow, about this time, a seer of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Now we'll come to the details in a minute. But first notice that with these words, Elisha introduced a new possibility into the hopeless circumstances in Samaria that day. Can you see it? Everyone could see the suffering. Everyone knew that the king was unable to do anything to help. Everyone knew that the entire Syrian army was there to ensure that no aid came to the city. No one could see any possibility of relief, any reason to hope at all. Then Elisha called on the king and those with him to hear the word of the Lord. That would make a difference. Now, on the one hand, this is obviously a summons to listen to the particularly remarkable promise that that Elisha then uttered. We'll come to that. But on the other hand, the word of the Lord, well, that connects this promise to an overarching theme of biblical history. We've got to notice this. See, according to the Bible, the word of the Lord is the power behind everything. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, Psalm 33. The word of the Lord, the word of the Lord is God's commitment to his good purpose for his people and for all of creation. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord, you remember, you know your Bibles well. The word of the Lord came to Abraham, came to Samuel, came to Nathan, and to many, many more. The word of the Lord came in various words at different times and in different places. But this peculiar expression, the word of the Lord, points to the unity behind these messengers. God has spoken. The word of the Lord, 
is his promise, ultimately for all things. Elisha's call on this particular day in Samaria is therefore weighty. In the face of all that is happening, in the face of all that you can see, in the face of all that you can feel, hear the word of the Lord. The future will be determined neither by the famine and its ravages, nor by the impotence of your king, nor by the terror of the enemy. Hear the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord then came from Elisha's lips in the form of an astonishing promise. Within 24 hours, within 24 hours, wholesome food, fine flour and barley. I don't know whether you like fine flour and barley, but tell you what you would have liked it if you were there that day. <laughs> Going to be available in some area at reasonable prices. The promise, of course, was at complete odds with the circumstances in Samaria that day. There was no food in the city, none. There was no way that supplies could be replenished. And yet, according to Elisha, there was hope. Because there was a promise. The promise was not wishful thinking. The promise was not a plan of action. It was the word of the Lord. Hear it. Now, friends, this is the first point at which the events of 2 Kings uh, chapter 7 anticipate the Christian experience of hope in the face of terrible suffering. The word of the Lord has now come to its fulfillment, or if you like, its full expression in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The various expressions of the word of the Lord through the pages of the Old Testament were the early whispers of the word of the Lord that is now proclaimed throughout the whole world. There is hope for our troubled world and each of our troubled worlds, because there's a promise. The promise is not wishful thinking, it is not a strategy, it is the word of the Lord. As Peter puts it, and this word is the gospel that was preached to you. Hear it. You see, the thing about the word of the Lord is that it is as reliable as the Lord whose word it is. The point of hearing the word of the Lord is to believe what you hear. For those who believe only what they see, who believe only what they feel, then yeah, in the face of terrible suffering, there is no hope. And indeed, on that day, come back to the account. This is why it takes so long, isn't it? You can, you, why don't you stick with the text, John? That would help. <laughs> but on that day, there was at least one man outside Elisha's house who was in no mood to take seriously what he heard from the other side of the closed door. He was the king's right-hand man. Look at verse 2. Then the captain on whose hand the king leaned said to the man of God, if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? Uh, it's mocking. The mocking tone is not, not surprising in the circumstances. This man knew what he could see, and what he could see around him was so bad, so bad, that he was unwilling, and don't be too judgmental of him, or at least not superior to him as you look on, uh, I, I can sense how he, could, how, he could, how he could feel unable to believe what he heard. Elisha responded to the captain's criticism. It's in verse 2 again. You shall see it 
with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. You'll see, you will see what has been promised, but you will not benefit from a promise you refuse to believe. That's how it is. Two, the surprise of hope. <laughs> at this point, we leave the rather tense standoff at Elisha's house. You're just wondering what's going to happen there. It's unresolved. We leave there. The camera moves, so to speak, suddenly changes to an apparently unrelated situation some distance away, just outside the city gate. Come with me to verse 3. Now, there were, there were four men who were lepers at the entrance to the gate. And they said to one another, why, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, let us enter the city, well, the famine's in the city and we'll, we'll just die there. If we sit here, we'll die also. So now come, let's go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. If they kill us, we'll just die. These four characters, I don't know who you'd like to play them if you were filming this, but I can almost, I can almost, I think Alistair Begg's got to be one of them. <laughs> but their circumstances were, if this is possible, more terrible than anyone we have met so far in the suffering city of Samaria. They too were facing the horror of a slow death by starvation, but they were also lepers. Do you remember Jesus yesterday? There were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. Well, here's four of them. They had not heard the strange promise Elisha had uttered back in verse 1. Their banter has, it's got a dark kind of humour, has it? Why are we sitting here at the city gate? We're going to die. But if we go into the city, we'll die. There's no food there. But if we don't go into the city, we'll die. There's no food here either. How about deserting to the enemy? They'll probably kill us. Let's do that. <laughs> now, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give too much weight to their if they spare our lives in verse 4, for those of you who are as pedantic as I am and want to concentrate on every little bit. Oh, that's sarcasm, I've got no doubt, a scenario with a probability of approximately zero. <laughs> but they made the choice of a quick and almost certain death by the enemy's sword over a slow, painful, and absolutely certain death by starvation. The banter of these four lepers, it's ridiculous because it's so pointless. I have found myself getting a little carried away in reflecting on this story. It is so, it is so rich with all sorts of things. So it, 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 do allow me a little bit of uh, leeway, will you? But it's not so different, is it? This banter from the plans and schemes and efforts that surround us, that we keep hearing all the time, the banter and ways in which we're going to overcome the troubles of our world. We're going to die. Let's do this. Oh, we'll die. Well, let's do that. And we'll die. What are we going to... Well, let's follow these four desperate men. Verse 5. So they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. They wasted no time, the, the sun was fading, and they set out. The cover of darkness uh, might delay the inevitable, and they make their way. I want you to try and picture them. Uh, I see them slowly, fearfully, I'm imagining. They make their way towards the enemy camp. Verse 5 again. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians... Behold, there was no one there. Now their shock is signalled with that word behold. As you get into narratives, th th this is one tiny little thing. Look out for that word behold. It's always, it's always signalling a shock. It's signalling a particular point of view and, and the way in which you see things. This is what they saw. There was no one there. How could that be? I mean, it, it had been the presence of the mighty army of Syria that had driven the city of Samaria to the, dress, the, 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 the dreadful circumstances, the desperate state of affairs, the certainty of death, the horror of cannibalism, everything we've witnessed in the story so far, it was the presence of the enemy forces that made the situation 
hopeless. Just imagine the the startled disbelief, really, of the four men who came to the edge of the Kennedy camp and there was no one there. Events had taken a turn that could not have been predicted, could not be explained. I mean, no strategic analysis of the situation could have foreseen what the four lepers now discovered as darkness was falling over the enemy camp. There was no one there. No one. In other words, something had happened in their world that they could not have anticipated. Unless, perhaps, they had heard the word of the Lord. But they hadn't. Now again, at the risk of being accused of drawing a long bow, I want to say that it was a bit like those who came to a tomb on a Sunday morning many years later, thinking that death had triumphed. To their utter surprise, there was no one there. Something had happened that could not possibly have been anticipated unless, of course, they had listened to the words of Jesus. The source of hope, the surprise of hope. Three, the secret of hope. We're going well, aren't we, with these alliterations? Yeah. The secret of hope, verses 6 and 7. We should... Do do our best to to feel the shock of the four deserters at the edge of the enemy camp. What's going on? How is it possible that there was no one there? Now, these four men in their desperate state did not feel the need for answers to these obvious questions. We'll see that in a moment. But our historian breaks into the narrative to let his readers know what none of the characters will ever know. Elisha perhaps accepted. This, he tells us, is what had happened. You want to know what's happened? He'll let us in on it. Verse 6. For the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sound of chariots and horses and the sound of a great army. No one else heard this. But the enemy soldiers in the camp all heard the clamour of an approaching mighty army, the pounding of horses' hooves, the din of the chariots. It was terrifying. Now, it was, of course, a miracle. The Lord had made them hear this. Read on in verse 6. So that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of of Egypt to to come against us. And so... They fled away in the twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses, their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was and fled for their lives. What they said to one another, it's, this is a little feature of this story, I, it's really quite delightful. It's, it, it's, it's sort of in its own way as amusing as what the four lepers had said to one another in verse 3. Like the lepers, they reasoned on the basis of what they could perceive. What's that noise? Sounds like an army. Sounds like a big army. Sounds like a really big army. Sounds as big as the Hittites and the Egyptians combined. The king of Israel must have somehow persuaded them to come and wipe us out. There's no point in pausing on the details, by the way, as some of the commentaries do and try and weigh up the inconsistencies. And what. Of course, it's, that's the point. They're panicking. And the, ter- the, 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 the terrified Syrian army simply fled for their lives, leaving everything in the camp as it was. Notice the words in verse 7, in the twilight. It's exactly the same phrase in the original as in verse 5, at twilight. So at the very moment when the lepers were getting up to make their way cautiously from the city gate to the Syrian camp in verse 5, the army in that camp were springing to their feet 
and fleeing from the camp as quickly as possible, verse 7. The last soldier was probably scrambling away just minutes before the lepers arrived to discover that there was no one there. Now, rebuke me later on, but I, I, I just want to keep pressing this analogy, if I may. But isn't this again a little bit like that empty tomb? The absence of Jesus' body was because of a mysterious unseen act of God. The witnesses to the empty tomb didn't see, and they'll never know how it happened, but there was no one there. So the source of hope, the word of the Lord, a promise. The surprise of hope, Things happen that are beyond our understanding because of the promise. The secret of hope, God works in ways unseen by us. And four, I apologise for this, sort of a um, little bit corny, isn't it, when you, when, you, when you make things rhyme or you use the same letter. It just fell out this way, it just happened. For the significance of hope. <laughs> The significance of hope, verses 8 to 11. Verses 6 and 7 were a flashback. Verse 8 now picks up the exact words of verse 5, and when these lepers came to the edge of the camp. So we're picking up the narrative at the point of their astonished discovery. Behold, there was no one there. Their first reaction to behold, there was no one there was, verse 8, they went into a tent and ate and drank. Well, of course they did. For all they knew, the enemy army could return at any minute. And I imagine them grabbing any food, drink they can lay their hands on and just gorging themselves. It may have taken some time. Still, there was no sign of the enemy soldiers. With hunger and thirst satisfied and without a lot of thought, I, I, it seems to me, they, they turned to make the most of this unbelievable situation. Verse 8, they carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried off things from it and went and hid them. I don't think this was premeditated. These men were desperate. They were overwhelmed. They were confused. But at some point, the frantic activity stopped. Again, I kind of picture them collapsing, exhausted. Whoa. There was still no sign of the enemy army returning. And I picture these guys looking at one another. One of them looks like Alistair again. <laughs> and they began to think. Just began to think about what had happened. They couldn't explain it. Of course they couldn't. But the facts were clear. The enemy was nowhere to be seen. The entire contents of the Syrian camp were there for the taking which is what they'd been doing. But as they puff and pant and just lie there, something happens. Something happens in their conscience. And they said to one another, here we got it again, they said to one another, listen to this, we're not doing right. We are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. Now this is more clear-headed than any of the banter that we've heard earlier. What we are doing is not right. Why? What was it that troubled them? I don't think that this is like the sin of Achan. You might sort of feel a comparison in your head in you know, centuries earlier when there had been a clear command from God that the enemy property should not on that occasion be taken. You know, like in Joshua chapter 6 and 7. Nor do I think it was like the more recent uh, episode. We didn't get to it the other, yesterday, but, but you, you remember the story of the greed of Gehazi at the end of chapter 5 involving deceit and lies. Now, it's not the same as that. What was not right? What was not right about the four lepers helping themselves to the property that the enemy army had left behind. 
And it seems to me that with remarkable insight, the lepers realised that their grasping of silver and gold and clothing was not right at that moment because this is a day of good news. This is a gospel day, we might say. Like our word gospel, the Hebrew word behind good news, it means, it means important news, it means momentous news. Something absolutely momentous has happened. This is no time for grasping what we can get. What were you thinking? Now remember, the lepers had not heard the promise spoken by Elisha earlier in verse 1. Nor did they know that the enemy camp empty, was the result of an act of God described in verse 6. They don't know that. But they knew that what had happened was huge. It must have been dawning on them that in some remarkable way Samaria had been delivered from her troubles. There was no sign of the enemy returning. The consequences of there was no one there were massive. This is not an occasion for grabbing stuff for ourselves. It struck me as I thought about this that the insight of the four lepers was astonishing in the circumstances and astonishing and, and, and of lasting importance. It's a little bit like Elisha yesterday, isn't it? Just in principle, the circumstances are different, but the insight is the same. The kindness of God which is what they had experienced, even if they didn't yet understand that, must not be made an opportunity to grab stuff for ourselves. The principle is one that gets developed and thought through uh, through the Scriptures, and it, it's spelled out wonderfully by, by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We must not imagine that the truth of God's grace is a means for gain. It seems to me it's the same idea, it's the same insight. Nor must we imagine that the desire to be rich can possibly be compatible with the news of what God has done in Jesus Christ and the sound teaching that accords with godliness. See, the lepers were right. And they concluded, verse 9, if we're silent and wait till the morning light, Punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come. Let us go and tell the king's household. What had happened, they realised, was such that it had to be made known. It was not the kind of thing that they could be excused for being silent about. That's what a gospel is like. Forget the loot. We must go and tell the king and his people. And that's what they did. Verse 10. So they came and called the gatekeepers of the city and told them, we came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no one to be seen or heard there. Nothing but the horses tied and the donkeys tied and the tents as they were. Then the gatekeepers called out and it was told within the king's household. The lepers, of course, they made no attempt to explain what had happened. I mean, how could they? They simply reported what they had seen. There's no one there. I've run out of S's. Number five, too good to be true. <laughs> too good to be true. 12 to 15, verses 12 to 15. Uh, it, it is, uh, following the story, it must have been getting late. Uh, perhaps it was the wee hours of the morning. Um, considerable time had passed since dusk when the lepers had left the city gate to go down to the Syrian camp. The news they now brought back was of such magnitude that the king had to be woken up and told, this gospel of salvation, as we may reasonably call it, had to be told to the king. How would the king respond? This despondent king that we heard at the end of Chapter 6. How would he respond to the tremendous news that now reached the palace? Too good to be true? Look at verse 10, uh, sorry, verse 12. And the king rose in the night and said to his servants, 
I'll tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry. Therefore, they've gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the open country, thinking when they come out of the city, we'll take them alive and get into the city. Now, the king, he had heard the promise in verse 1, but he couldn't bring himself to see what had now happened in the light of the promise. He had a better explanation. One of the king's subordinates was bold enough to see that this gospel was at least worth checking out. Verse 13, one of the servants said, let us take five of the remaining horses and see that those, uh, and see that those who are left here will, sorry, I'll read that again. And one of the servants said, let some men take five of the remaining horses, seeing that those who are left here will fare like the whole multitude of Israel who have already perished. Let's send and see. See, anyone who took the promise seriously, and I got a suspicion that these servants knew about the promise. They'd heard rumours about what, what, what had been said a little earlier in Elisha's house. But anyone who took the promise remotely seriously would want to check out the eyewitness testimony of the lepers. So verse 14, so they took two horsemen, and the king sent them after the army of the Syrians, saying, go and see. So they went after them as far as the Jordan, and behold, here's that word again, behold, all the way was littered with garments and equipment that the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king, strewn over... Uh, you, you work this out on the, in your Bible atlas, it could, it could have been about 30 miles, depending on the route that they took. They found clear evidence of the Syrians' panicked flight, stuff thrown everywhere. There was no denying the fact the Syrians had gone. What the lepers had reported was true. Now bear with me, but I cannot help thinking of another momentous day when a few women brought the news that the tomb was empty. You might remember there was a reasonable explanation then too. Well, it's not all that reasonable, but it's recorded in, uh, in, in Matthew's account. You remember that? But when the news was checked out, what the women reported was discovered to be true. Finally, six how hope works. Uh, verses 16 through to 20. The consequences, of course, of what had happened for the inhabitants of Samaria can hardly be overstated. The terrible troubles that began with the siege back in chapter 6, verse 24, were over. Verse 16, then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Syrians. So... Surprise, surprise, a seer of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. That's what the word of the Lord is like, you see. What is promised happens, always. Therefore, refusing to believe the word of the Lord in this world, in this life, refusing to believe the word of the Lord is the biggest mistake you can make. Refusing to believe the word of the Lord as the captain had done less than 24 hours earlier, well, that has consequences. You're better off trying to defy gravity than to refuse to believe the word of the Lord. And this story concludes, I can't quite work out why, but with a strangely lengthy account of what happened to the captain. I think we're meant to notice this. Verse 17, now the captain, sorry, now the king had appointed the captain on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. I'm getting weary. Okay, I'll read that again. <laughs> now the king had appointed the captain on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. And the people trampled him in the gate so that he died, as the man of God had said. 
when the king came down to him. For when the man of God had said to the king, two seers of barley shall be sold for a shekel and a seer of fine flour for a shekel about this time in the gate of Samaria, the captain had answered the man of God, if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, how could such a thing be? And he had said, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gate and he died. You hear that? We're meant to notice this, there's a whole paragraph given to it. To despise the word of the Lord, to refuse to believe the word of the Lord, which is to despise the word of the Lord, is to despise the Lord himself. And that has to have consequences. And it does. Well, what a story. But again, we see, don't we, how the particular experience of Israel in those terrible days of suffering reflects in a shadowy way the truth about our troubled world. What is the right response to the horrors that we face? or the horrors that we witness? Is it not simply but profoundly this? Hear the word of the Lord. There is a promise to be taken seriously. No, not now of reasonably priced food within 24 hours, but of sins forgiven, of the end of all tears, of no more pain, of eternal life. The gospel of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. There was no one there. It's the hope of the world. Hear it. Believe it. And the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope yeah, in the midst of suffering. Please pray with me. Our God and Heavenly Father, we beg you to open our ears that we might hear the word of the Lord. We recognise in ourselves, let alone the world around us, we recognise a hesitancy to hear the word of the Lord, to take the word of the Lord with more seriousness than we take the things that we see. We thank you, our God and Heavenly Father, that we live life in this world with a promise, an extraordinary promise, the promise of the resurrection of Jesus. We pray, our Heavenly Father, that this gospel might go out into our troubled world. Mm -hmm. We pray for our troubled world, our hopeless world, and we pray that this word might be on our lips. We pray that you might have this mercy on us, that many, many people will hear the word of the Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand once again and sing.
Father God, we so easily forget. And so we thank you again for the word of the Lord. We thank you that uh, our hope is in Jesus, the word made flesh, who lives and reigns. And although it doesn't always feel so, it is so. And so we pray that you would make us men just like those lepers who go to tell of good news of the word of the Lord that has come true. Uh, give us the courage, the kindness, and the clarity to do that in a way that honors you and your word. Uh, we pray this for your glory. Amen. Amen. Gentlemen, you are dismissed until we are back here at uh, 11 o'clock. We will see you then.